my Adore, my 64, my Commodore 64. Hi there, and welcome to a Let's Type episode from the Commodore 64 Appreciation Society. This is a series where I reach back into the past and type out a program from an old computer magazine or book. And then when I finish typing it in, I play it. So far, all the videos in this series have focused on type-in programs for magazines. Every month, millions of us waited anxiously for the latest issues of Compute, Ahoy, or Zap64 to show up in the mailbox. We'd flip through the ads for the newest games, read the articles, and of course, type in whatever new programs came with the issue. It was a great time. But magazines weren't the only source for type-ins. You could find programs in hobbyist newsletters, local computer clubs, or even from friends who'd photocopy, which was still kind of futuristic itself, pages of code to share around. And then there were the books, so many of them, packed with programs to type in by hand. Some reprinted magazine favorites, while others featured brand new games you couldn't find anywhere else. The book we're diving into today is one of the latter. It's called More Basic Computer Games, and it's full of short titles that felt pretty groundbreaking in 1979, which is when it was published. A viewer suggested I try out a game from it called Black Box, and that's exactly what we're going to do. It seemed like a fun and interesting challenge, so let's get started. More Basic Computer Games was edited by David All, who was also the founder of the publishing company Creative Computing Press. The book includes 84 games written in Microsoft Basic, and they were intentionally kept generic so they could run on just about any computer of the era. That also means they're pretty bare bones. No fancy graphics, no sound effects, and definitely no sprites sipping around the screen. In fact, this book was so early that the programs had to be compatible for computers that didn't even output to a screen. Because, believe it or not, that wasn't a given in the 1970s. Back then, plenty of computers didn't output to a monitor at all. Instead, they sent everything to a printer, so players would literally track their game's progress on sheets of paper. Rage quitting was definitely more of a drawn-out process back then. The game I'm typing in here, Black Box, sounds really cool. It's based on a puzzle that first appeared in the August 77 issue of Games and Puzzles magazine, and there was a board game version of it as well. A lot of early computer games were like this, actually, digital versions of existing games. It was amazing to see a machine take care of all the tedious calculations while you focused on the fun part, trying to outsmart it. Here's how Black Box works. Imagine an 8x8 grid with a few invisible atoms hidden inside. Your job is to figure out where they are by firing rays into the grid from the edges. The game tells you where each ray comes out, or if it doesn't come out at all, and from that, you have to deduce what's going on inside. The rays follow a few simple rules. If it hits an atom head-on, it's absorbed. If it passes close by on a diagonal, it's deflected at a right angle. If the ray passes an atom that is on the edge of the board, or tries to pass two atoms that are beside each other, it reflects. And if nothing's in the way, it just travels straight through. It's basically a quantum mechanics version of Battleship. To be honest, it sounds a little complex to keep track of, especially if there are several atoms hiding in there. I'm really curious to see how this version handles the display, or whether it just leaves you to imagine what's happening. Either way, I'm looking forward to seeing how it plays out. This is such a short program, it's only about 60 lines of code or so. As I'm approaching the end, I thought it would be cool to browse a little through the book. It's such a fun read, and it really captures the optimism people had about computers at the time. In 1978, the idea of owning a personal computer was just starting to become real, and people saw them as tools of liberation, machines that could educate us, empower us, and maybe even make us smarter. Automating boring tasks sounded like the start of a golden age, shorter work weeks, more free time, and a better society all around. Kinda sounds like what we're saying about AI right now, but without the dystopia. The book reflects that spirit perfectly. In the foreword, written by author and composer Christopher Cerf, he talks about how computers open up possibilities for fun, learning, and creativity. He even mentions being amazed that a computer he'd just played could actually call him by name. And the games themselves are presented in such an endearing way. The idea that you could play cards, draw geometric art, or even chat with a computer felt thrilling and futuristic. This really was the future, or at least what the future looked like in 1979. 
To top it off, David All filled the book with charming illustrations, little visual set pieces that helped you imagine what was happening on screen because, well, the actual game screens didn't show much at all. Back then, playing games required a lot of imagination and maybe some graph paper. Okay, I'm on the very last line here. I'll finish it up and then save it. Wow, this is probably the smallest game I've ever typed in. On disk, it takes up six blocks or just one and a half K. Just before we start, I do want to mention a couple small changes I made to the program, which was to add a line to clear the screen and to center the text at the top. And here we are. I'm going to start with the easiest configuration possible, which is one atom. And since this is the first time through, I'll skip right to the end by pressing return just to make sure that it works. Hmm, that doesn't look quite right. And I don't think I entered the numbers incorrectly, but that's cool. And nice, here's the map of where it is. Okay, so that part works, let's try again. We'll try it with three atoms this time. Let's send the ray in at spot three. And it says that it comes out at 14, which means it deflected at column six. Let's try 23. Oh, illegal quantity error. That's not good. I'll need to track that down. But first, I'm going to adjust some of the text so it doesn't wrap around the screen. It looks pretty ugly right now. Going back to that error, line 310 is exactly the same as the one in the book. So this most likely means that one of the values is being set incorrectly. Time for a code review. <laughs> For such a small program, I sure had my share of typos. It's no wonder the thing didn't work. In fact, I'm surprised that I was able to play it at all. But all good. The code is done, and I think we're ready for an actual game now. To make things easier, I'll use a template I created from the illustration in the book. It's fine mentally managing one atom and maybe two. More than that, and I'll need to visualize the interactions. This is old school. Okay, let's try it with three atoms. Spot 1. Okay, cool. It ended up at 32, which means it was deflected. I think this means that the atom is in row 2, column 2, but let's just confirm. Yep, sure enough, the ray sent in at spot 2 is absorbed, and it's also absorbed when we send one in from 31, so I feel pretty safe drawing an atom there. Okay, so rays sent in from 3 and 22 both get absorbed, which means there's an atom somewhere on row 3. Because they didn't deflect, I think it means that the atom has to be directly under the first one we found. But I'm not entirely sure. I'll get some more evidence. 16 is absorbed, which means there's an atom in column 8. And sending the ray into 15 deflects it to 6, which means that the atom in column 8 has to be on row 5. Just to make sure, I'll send the ray in at spots around it, and yeah, it's absorbed by all of them. So that one is settled. Rays at 29, 28, and 27 all shot straight through, but sending one in at 26 ended up at 11, which means that it deflected twice, and that confirms the atom at row 3, column 2. Cool! You can see why I needed that diagram. So now let's just enter the coordinates. <laughs> nice! 26 points. Good job, me. So, that's Black Box, a perfect example of games from this era. It's basically a pencil and paper puzzle, but here the computer is doing the hard part. The calculations, the bookkeeping, and keeping your pencil from snapping in frustration. <laughs> in the late 70s, stuff like this felt absolutely magical. The idea that a home computer could play a game like this, all from a few lines of code you typed in yourself, blew people's minds. It was a simpler time, and I feel really lucky to have been around to experience some of that wonder firsthand. 
This one was a lot of fun, and I'll definitely be typing in more games from this book. Thanks to Isaac for the recommendation, and kudos to David All for putting together such a wonderful time capsule of early computing. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider leaving a like or subscribing. If you have experiences typing in programs for more basic computer games, or any other pixelated memories you'd like to share, drop them in the comments. Hope to see you again.